Welcome everyone to the Hedgehog Noonday discussion. And for those here, you get to hear me introduce it twice. Um, my name is Jonathan Teubner. I'm a contributing editor at the Hedgehog Review and a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture where the Hedgehog Review is based. I'm excited to very briefly introduce Professor Charles Taylor today. Um, many of us already know very well Professor Taylor's works, which include um, mega bestsellers, I guess, in philosophy, Sources of the Self and the Secular Age, and more recently, The Degeneration of Democracy that he co-authored with two others. For those joining virtually, the occasion for Professor Taylor's lecture is the symposium Reading and Repairing the Social Fabric, co-sponsored by the Harvard Human Flourishing Program and the Institute for Religion and Critical Inquiry at the Australian Catholic University who is also hosting us here in their beautiful Rome campus. This symposium has brought together a wide range of scholars from the fields of social sciences and humanities to think about and gain some clarity on the increasing problem about loneliness, um, social isolation, and the ways in which this has rippled through our societies. I think Professor Taylor will be probably drawing on some of the comments that were made throughout our very rich discussion today. Um, we will, I think he's gonna speak for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have a Q&A. We hope those who are virtually, those who stuck it out, um, persevered with us, hope that you will stay around and listen to it. But let me welcome Professor Taylor to, thank you. Okay, yes, thank you very much. And I've learned a lot from the discussion so far. You'll see reflected in, in my remarks. But uh, what you want to want to do is a little bit channel that book that uh, Jonathan referred to, joint book with Craig Calhoun and Didier Goncar, where we tried to look on what, what's heading us in our downward spiral for the last, I don't know, <clears throat> maybe three or four months. Is, I, it should be closer, or maybe I, sh I, sh I should be closer to it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> now, our basic approach to, uh, is that democracy is never something you build, perfect, and it remains forever. It's not like you know building the pyramids. That history changes, the basis of power change, and so you have to reinvent it in every new age. If the Base of power was once uh, landed property, and then it was large corporations, and now it's largely in the financial field. Then the whole problem of countervailing elite power, which is central to democracy, becomes quite different project. And if you're still running, and if you're still running with the policies of the past, you're going to be sliding away. And it's our belief that we started around 1970. <laughs> Sliding away from the relative high of post-war, post-war, post, in the American case, the New Deal uh, society, which built not only moved to full employment, built a, the welfare state, and so on, and reduced inequality. So that there was a, a period when the, 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 the level of inequality, the Gini coefficient, however that is calculated, was quite low. And then about 1970, we started to move away from this. And the Gini coefficient of many Western societies is now astronomically different <clears throat> in the, and galloping. That is, the inequality is building on the previous inequality and, and is moving away from it, from, from any kind of uh, possible <clears throat> notion of social equality. And that, of course, for a whole lot of reasons, which I won't go into because I think everyone's familiar here, that kind of inequality is terrible for democracy, saps uh, democratic unity. Now, so we have a situation now in which a lot of people, a lot of non-elites, shall I get closer to the mic, or shall I actually hold it? Yeah. A lot of non-elites have suffered what I, what I want to call the great downgrade. That is, <clears throat> you know, your father maybe was working for a large, what people call Fordist uh, 
corporation with uh, lifetime security, with benefits, and so on. And maybe you, or uh, maybe your grandfather now, but you at this, at this present moment, you're maybe struggling to survive by combining a number of part-time and very precarious jobs and so on. And you can't you know, give your children the kind of start in life that your parents or grandparents gave their children. There's a lot of people in Western society who are in this kind of, a kind of predicament. <clears throat> and you could also say that uh, there's another way in which the decline has occurred in almost all Western societies is the decline in lesser centers and the tremendous concentration of population and activity and employment and so on in a few large centers. Or it could be, you know, in the UK, it's largely the southeast around London, but there's about eight or 10 large centers in the United States. And the smaller centers, where they've got vigorous life, vigorous sometimes in the parishes, vigorous in their being local newspaper, vigorous in there being all the kinds of local associations has been bled away. I mean, and all the kids have gone and, you know, the sense among the parents is that they're sort of abandoned there in the, in the back country. And that's, so there's this tremendous sense of, uh, of, uh, of loss, of downgrade, of the existence of rust belts and so on. That is one of the things which has generated the present crisis. Now, this crisis, this decline, was the result, the obvious uh, side, of a massive failure of solidarity, which is rather hard to explain. So, social solidarity was really quite high in 1945, 48, and so on in many Western societies, and it's been bled away to a remarkable degree. I'm not going to be able to uh, conjecture what the deep causes are, but certainly it's been facilitated by a great change of, in, in uh, mentality and outlook, which we can really associate with, the, with uh, neoliberalism, if you like. And neoliberalism, I mean the, the basic the notion of Hayek, which has also gained a tremendous amount of following in West, among Western elites, is the idea that really, the market left free will solve all problems. Right? Now, what problems that the market obviously doesn't solve is the uh, problem of distribution, of fair distribution. But so powerful has been this ideology in a Western politics vehicle principally by Thatcher in the UK and, and Reagan in the United States with the always to me utterly incredible idea that it'll all trickle down, right? If we just increase GNP as fast as we can, it'll all trickle down and everybody, all boats will rise together. <clears throat> and that clearly is not the case, right? So you have galloping inequality and now inequality which feeds on uh, previous inequality and, <clears throat> and uh, the, this, the hold of this kind of mindset is still tremendously strong among at least right-wing parties and right-wing governments. And another part of the mentality is the, as Michael Sandel has, I think, brilliantly shown in his, in his book, The Tyranny of Merit, the certain conception of meritocracy, uh, which couple with the belief that the meritocracy is now in effect, right? So if I'm successful, yeah, and this applies not only to entrepreneur and people in business and so on, this applies to the whole, whole lot of people in the managerial professional classes. You know, if I'm well off, then obviously I deserve it. And if my cousin back there <laughs> in the village who hasn't, may have managed to make it in New York or London, well, maybe he just didn't try enough or he didn't really have the, the, the guts, the gumption. And, and um, so that's, uh, we don't need to do anything about this because I mean, it's, it's really their, their fault. So this, these two mentalities, if you like, 
which we really have to perhaps more deeply understand why they're there, but they, they certainly have made it possible for this massive failure to reach out to people who are in difficult circumstances. In many cases where it would have been, you know, relatively easy to do so of some kind, uh, they were crippled for a moment by one member of the family having a very, you know, bad disease, but if they had the money or had the uh, means to go to the doctor and so on, they could have got, gone ahead, but they were, their upward path was, as it were, imp uh, impeded and, or sabotaged by this. And the third bit of mentality, which I think is very important to explain this, and another thing we have to fight against, is the stance towards the planet, the stance towards our universe, which, I mean, is connected to the immense prestige of a scientifically based manipulative stance towards the natural world, which we see, of course, producing the... the the actual climate crisis in which we find ourselves, but which is still tremendously powerful. I mean, people are, the very successful people <laughs> you know, are now thinking that the next thing we should do is fly to Mars, you know, so right off <laughs> this planet and and <clears throat> and take, a, take a, a happy few, a happy minority so, yeah, yeah, to, to some other planet. So these, these three mindsets, have been an obstacle to our seeing what we've been doing to ourselves. Now, this neoliberal globalization has, because it's been carried on without any, any questioning and any attempt to offset its consequences, it's had another very, very bad uh, consequence for us, because what it does very well, if you are creating the maximum conditions in which companies, corporations, and others who are mainly in the business of selling individual goods and services can function most efficiently by, if necessary, off, offshoring to Burma or Bangladesh in order to have cheaper products. So we have a glow, growing panoply of, of products produced more cheaply than ever before, more widely available than ever before. If that is the goal in life, then these policies are absolutely bang on. But the result of that has been to skew our basic priorities because spending too much money on the public sector involves taxing these corporations, which if one of us, one country does it, they're likely to move elsewhere. And so, and so we have a starved public sector in all Western societies, right? Com in comparison, in the context of the standard of living we enjoy, or for instance, health services, services for, for the elderly, or which are two of the big things that our kind of society is requiring, particularly as, you know, we old folks are becoming more and more the majority in these societies, and we need some kind of attention and help, uh, that these have been starved to the point where, in a certain sense, the pandemic had a kind of almost providential role because it showed up very clearly how these services were totally inadequate. And a lot of people died because of that. And I mean, you know, in Quebec and so on, it was just absolutely terrible. And in the old folks' homes at the beginning, there was just an immense number of, of, of patients who died because there wasn't adequate staff, you know, which, which one needed when a lot of people went into <clears throat> a crisis of having COVID at, at the same time. Okay, so that's there is uh, this is one of the periods, in other words, in which democracy, which sometimes comes close to its goal of real equality and and the general good slides away right now you might ask why did the victims of the what i call the great downgrade not immediately vote for people who would rectify these things right why on the contrary in many Western countries, and of course, I'll take the perhaps two famous cases of the United States, obviously, uh, vote for someone like Trump, as against voting for his, the opposition policy, which would at least be, you know, somewhat closer to the interest of these people. 
Well, thereby hangs, I think, another very important factor in the in the whole situation, that there was a, there are certain situations in which the society becomes opaque to its members, so that they don't really see what causes what or what levers to pull, if any, to rectify their grievances. And this you quite clearly see in, in this case, again, if you take, see, so the idea of I'm, I'm doing much worse than my grandpa and I need three little, uh, you know, precarious jobs to survive, therefore I'm voting for Trump. But insane in a certain sense. The first thing Trump did when he got to power was passed the most progressive tax law in, in modern US history. The second thing he did was try to destroy totally Obamacare. And that's very interesting because the, the fight against Obamacare by the American right started in 2010, right? Just after it was, and people got very worked up and you could get majorities to say, this is absolutely terrible. And partly because of that, you know, Obama lost the midterms. And, you know, a little bit uh, shades of what's happening today again. And <clears throat> he was really stymied. But when six years later, whatever it was, in 2016, they tried to destroy Obamacare, it had been in operation a long enough so that a lot of people had actually got uh, health insurance that wouldn't have otherwise. So even some Republican congressmen began to get sort of murmurs from their constituency. Maybe you should, and the the attempt to you know get rid of Obamacare collapsed. So you can see that the opacity is not necessarily total. But why why this degree of opacity? I think it's because they like a, a really transparent society democratic society we got a lesson here it's much depends on much more than just the facts being produced and uh, you know being able to dial up a certain center and learn what what's who's being who's surveying whom etc cetera, etc cetera. that that's obviously important but it's much more that there have to that people have to get the habit of working with intermediary bodies like like trade unions, like parties which really have discussions of what to do and so on, in which they, and they had to have some kind of connection with them in which these bodies in which really important discussions are going on about what should be done and so on, and that filters down, right? If you have, as you have in many Western societies, great decline in the number of people in trade unions, a great decline in the kinds of discussions people used to have in party memberships and so on, then that opacity grows. And really what we need, well, this is one of the first lessons I want to draw <laughs> after looking at this very, very grim uh, development. One of the first lessons we have to draw is that we need to recreate some of these, if you like to call it intermediary bodies. It sounds like Montesquieu <laughs> arguing against the French Revolution, but you know, as it were, channels in which certain things can be debated and then come up, be sent up, and put pressure on the political system. Now, these will be different. I mean, for instance, uh, instead of trade union movement rebuilt exclusively on the model of people in this industry and people in that industry, et cetera. There is a move now to develop a sort of workers movement, which will include a lot of people, including the, including the gig economy, right? And I think this movement will be, I hope, more and more successful. But this will be rebuilding something like the trade union movement, but in the contemporary uh, situation, much more, uh, <clears throat> much more suitable, right? Another thing that we definitely need, and it's, again, it exists in small, smaller quantities, is when people in a given region, leaders of some kind or other, get together, cross boundaries, Democrats will talk to Republicans, begin to 
consult in the in the society. You know, we're, we're, we have too, too, too few opportunities of, of employment here. What do you what do you think we have? What should we try to attract here? And one develops not only a lot of very interesting facts and which are very important to understand what to demand of the state government and the federal government and so on, but develops a kind of consciousness, general consciousness of this, these are our goals, which means that there is behind the demand of, to the higher governments to do something, a real political punch, if everybody understands it. <clears throat> and then, then the votes will change unless something is is done. So there are the remedies in this sphere which we have to we have to think about. And so we have to look at it in in this kind of light. Our sense of political identity as Americans, Canadians, Quebecois, French, and so on, is a very important source of solidarity, right? But it is this source doesn't really get released and work if we have all these obstacles to people's understanding of what's going on. But the problem actually goes deeper than that, and I want to get into the ugly part of the, of the story. Uh, <laughs> what, what I said now is pretty terrible, but it wasn't as bad as it has become, because what we have now what people call very often right-wing populism, the kind of thing shared by Trump, Marine Le Pen, uh, uh, you know, by, <clears throat> I think, certain of what's behind the movement of Brexit in the UK around uh, present Italian government, uh, but I don't want to go into that, maybe, uh, is a very deep rejection of solidarity with people who are different. And this has two dimensions to it, two forms to it. One is the sense of resistance to outsiders coming in, right? To, and this is, in a certain sense, rather understandable. That is, if people have always been living in a group with the same culture, and you get a lot of people coming in with a different culture, there's a kind of fear. Now, I understand this because, frankly, in my society, I'm now talking about Quebec, not Canada as a whole. In my society, we have this, this French-speaking society whose existence is very fragile and which is an amazing achievement. You know, at the time of the conquest, there were 70,000 Francophones on the, on the banks of the St. Lawrence, and now there's eight and a half million, and the language is still living. So, so there's a kind of a potentiality for, I would put it this way, unscrupulous politicians to build around that fear of, of uh, desire for survival of the French language. And that's what the present Quebec government has done. And it has produced discriminatory legislation, which I won't, you know, go into here, which but we're gonna we're gonna go on fighting until we get that rescinded. And I want to talk about, but now in more general terms, what it means to fight that. But this is one, one level of the, the present crisis of rejection. And it happens to come at the same time that for a variety of reasons, international migration is at an absolute high, unknown in human history, partly because of wars like, like in Syria, but also partly because of the consequences of global warming, right? And so you have big parts of the Horn of Africa where it's become largely desert, right? And uh, in the in the Sahel, the same kind of thing has happened. And then this, in turn, produces conflict between you know between uh, herders and and uh, agricultural uh, societies. And <clears throat> but there is there is if we think. That international migration is uh, peaking and is about to decline. Think again. This is going to become a bigger and bigger and bigger problem. And <clears throat> but in face of that, we have this kind of resistance. And there is a certain kind of reaction that I think we have to take as normal and then try to work through it. The, the re first off reaction of people who are unused to immigrants, right? So you get even 
what I thought of, and I still in a way think of, as a tremendously solidaristic, even internationally, society, I'm talking about Sweden, right, in which the arrival of a lot of uh, refugees has meant that a party has arisen and taken a very important place in the in the parliament and upset the social democratic government and so on. So you have to have to work with this and try to calm down the fears and so on. But the, perhaps the most, the, that's one half the problem. The other half is that in a lot of societies, there is inclusion of everybody, but what I want, what has been called hierarchical inclusion, that is there is a self-understanding by lots of people that, yeah, we're all citizens and so on, but some of us are more important or more, have higher priority than others. And you can see all the dimensions. And I mean, a lot of men think that they are more important in, in terms of occupying certain slots than women, right? That, you know, that really they shouldn't be uh, rival, uh, have as rivals women for the, their, their slots. And their sense of themselves is, their sense of their own dignity, their own importance and so on, is a little bit shaken by this. Or take the United States case, you have a sense of racial superiority. Or in all our settler societies, you have a sense of superiority by the settlers in regard to the aboriginals. Or you get certain exclusions on the ground of, of sexual uh, difference, I mean, on the grounds of people having a different sexual orientation. Now, why has this, which has existed for centuries, become such a tremendous problem? Well, for actually very good reason. I mean, a good, good reason, not only explanatory, but a good development, that since about 1960s, and this is something, one of these changes that it would take, you know, not just one lecture, but a whole, a whole series of books to explain why it happened then, there suddenly was a rejection on the part of many, many people of these hierarchical uh, arrangements or hierarchical understandings, pushback. And this has in turn produced massive backlash in a number of countries. And you can see this very clearly in the United States. And that is what explains to a large degree the tremendous success of, of Donald Trump. Right? So we're faced with this really difficult, um, very difficult situation in which, if you like, our sense of the political identity has flown so, our senses so far apart between those who believe in this inclusion and those who are threatened by it, that the sense on each side is that the other side is betraying the political identity, right? <clears throat> I mean, it's not just on their side. It's also, <laughs> I'm sure I speak for everybody here when I talk about our side, we, we know what, what we mean, but it's, you know, frankly, we also have it on our side. I mean, I couldn't, you know, I'm going to go on fighting against this legislation in Quebec because being Quebecer means a lot to me and I feel shamed by this. And I'm, you know, I'm not going to, I'll have to go on fighting. So you can understand that when people say we're so, we're so polarized, we got to do something about this. We got to try to negotiate together. That's right in a way that we got to negotiate together on issues like what the budget's going to be and so on and so on and so on. But we can't split the difference between, you know, women are inferior or women are equal between, you know, th these citizens are, e are really full citizens or they're not, right? But uh, is there any hope of this? And I think there is a hope, and it resides in the following situation, that the people, some of the pe people, some of the forces that are fighting to make a more equal society have a deeper, I would understand this as a deeper ethical vision by ethics, I mean, I, I want to make an objection to the way that a lot of 
a discussion in philosophy of morals and ethics, which and introduce the following distinction, which some of us have in philosophy. You could say that morals gives us the rules where, you know, by which we treat each other. So the Ten Commandments are ex exercise in morals. The, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is, is a statement in what you might call morals. Ethics deals with what a really full human life would be like? What would it mean to live fully as a human being? And I think that in this regard, there have been various innovations, but there have been innovations, of course, in history recently in the field of morals, right? Because we only got the Universal Declaration in 48, and it took the awful experience of the Holocaust and the Gulag to finally wrench that out of us. But also, we are moving, there's a possibility there that is being offered to us, a tradition that runs from Gandhi through Martin Luther King uh, has led already, for instance, I mean, think of this remarkable fact, uh, communist governments in 91 fell one after another, once Gorbachev backed away from, you know, the threat of the Red Army, right? <clears throat> Not one of these was violent. Well, I mean, it was pretty bad for Ceausescu and his wife, but but they were not violent revolutions, nor was the overturn of the first Marcos in the Philippines. This is remarkable in history, right? Because these regimes themselves were so incredibly violent, right, that you would think that when people got rid of them, they would, for no other reason maybe than that they were just so angry. You know, they would want to go and hang somebody from the lamppost, right? But the leadership consistently held to the nonviolent. And this is a great, I think this is, God, I got to say this, is a great legacy of Gandhi to the modern world. And now you have it in the American case. The form that it comes in is this magnificent statement by John Lewis. Put down the burden of hatred. So the burden of hatred, it's not, it's hanging on to the superior position is not hanging on to something that, well, you can think it's in your interest, but it's crushing you. You have to, first of all, you have to lie to yourself about the supposed superiority. But secondly, I mean, let's took this, take this case of the white-black relations in the States. A lot of whites who believe in white supremacy actually know that they've done terrible things to the African-Americans. And they have a deep fear. I mean, the reason why, and this, is, this extends to Toronto and Montreal as well, why there's so much police shooting of Black people is partly fear. It's partly because they might, he might be pulling a gun, right? And why the fear? Because you're kind of aware that it's not totally without <laughs> something you can't understand because there's been this. So you have this, to be in that position, defending that position, you have to be doing in certain sense violence to yourself, doing away with real truth about yourself, doing away with of fear, and abandoning all the things that you and they could do together achievements you could make together if you were not uh, at loggerheads, right? And all that is contained in this very wise statement. You, I can't really get over it, so it's so profound. But hatred is a burden, right? And so there's an offer from one side to the other. We can be more fully human together. Yeah? And it's that's what I mean by ethical growth, what it is to be more fully human, right? So we are now, we in the present age, this is a way in which we're very lucky. We are heirs to uh, ethical development, what really human being means. For instance, that comes from Gandhi and the torch is passed on to Martin Luther King and is passed on to Václav Havel and all those people who made those revolutions in, in 91, right? 
and it's passed on to all of us. And it's passing on, this is the one thing that gives me real hope of winning my particular war in Quebec, but also of winning that war in, in the United States, that war, I mean, that the conflict, that, that, that controversy in the United States, that among younger people, I sense, that they, for many of them, their life experience is that meeting people who are very different and exchanging with them has been an immensely enriching experience. And I get this more and more. I mean, this is certainty, I mean, the, the polling we're doing in, in our fight in Quebec shows this. You get to the younger generation and the fact that they've met somebody who's a Muslim, you know, somebody said to me, you know, changed my mind. I used to agree with you were crazy, but now I, I really go with you. I, well, I met this friend Ahmed from Lebanon and he did for me that. So I got my back up. So, so you get this sense of the people are actually finding this an enriching experience. And this is what our way out could be, right? If that un understanding grows and spreads, these people even begin to think, you know, these older types are, are weird. What's their problem? Anyway, we have, it doesn't mean we don't have a fight on our hands. We certainly, certainly do. But I think we see a way out. Now, I have one footnote I want to add. All my friends think I'm just absolutely uh, so optimistic that I really almost living in cloud nine. But I, but I think that in this case, we're on to something, we're on to a possible way out. If you like, the age old divisions, which prevent us living up to the moral code, in this case, the universal declaration that we supposedly subscribe to, these can be washed away by a certain kind of ethical growth in which we come to understand that difference is actually tremendous richness, not just in general, not just because we get people with all sorts of skills who can you know, speak other languages and can help us export goods, but it is enriching to our own lives. And I have to admit that if I want to be autobiographical, that's how I feel. And more and more people I think are feeding this. So there is a way out, but but we have a very long way to go to make this general enough to overcome these tremendous divisions, which we can't, which have become exacerbated by the fact that these demands are now being made, right? And we can't unmake these demands, and we wouldn't if we could, even if we could. But we have to have the hope and faith to fight through long enough so that this new ethical understanding of what it is to be really human would grow and become the dominant view. So that's what I have to say. That's what I think about what's going wrong. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Taylor. Um, we can, I think we have some questions here, the people who want to, would you like to start us off? Maybe the first. Maybe. Sure. And please speak into the microphone here. And introduce yourself. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Almost good night. <laughs> when, I, when I say it up, uh, Professor Taylor, I'm, I'm Claudio Betti. I'm the, the director of uh, ACU campus uh, here in Rome. Now, uh, I'm, I'm speaking here probably out of place because I am not a theoretician of anything you have been saying until now you've been studying, but I'm more a practitioner of, uh, of everything you have been saying until now, really. From the very first word uh, to the end of your speech, I did, it did resound with my personal experience in dealing with the issues of our time. And, um, and I think that 
to a certain extent, I, had, I well, I totally agree with all your assumption, especially the one that uh, on on the lack of uh, intermediate um, um, entities. Yeah. But one one thing that uh, it strikes me oft, often is that to a certain extent, secular society have done a, a worse job than religious religions to a certain extent, um, especially in this idea of rediscovering the this new moral high ground on which diversity is not considered a loss but an, an advantage. I think that, for example, religions have been better than. Uh, than secular societies. And, and to a certain extent, religious leaders were better than politicians in, for example, uh, to, um, uh, dispelling war as a possibility of resolving uh, conflicts. Of course, uh, I'm talking about this last 15 years and not, not, I'm not going back to 2001. <laughs> uh, but uh, so I think that this is another dimension that I think we should explore uh, as religions, as probably one of those many intermediate uh, entities that could help the, the, the transformation of our world. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, we add a footnote to that. I think you can notice that the great bursting out, if you like, of different forms of spiritual searching that have, I think, characterized the secular age. Among these people, particularly younger people, there is a sense of uh, ecumenicism, which goes way beyond, I've lived long enough that I've seen this happen, right? In 1945, ecumenicism was, let's stop insulting each other, <laughs> and maybe one or two small, you know, cooperative operations, right? Now there is a real sense, a real desire to understand the other, a real desire to exchange with the other, a real interest, and a sense of enrichment coming from that among a lot of younger people with us on a certain spiritual path, right? So it's it's definitely that kind of ecumenicism is part of this. Uh, um, yeah. Hi, I'm Carla Pericinoto from UC San Francisco. Appreciate your remarks. Thank you. Um, one of the things that that strikes me and I appreciate is your hopefulness about a way out. Um, I say that as a parent of a young child, I say that as a human still living in this world, um, especially that you're saying that differences are richness. My, my worry, and though it sounds like you're an optimist, I'm a utopian pessimist. <laughs> um, and what I mean by that is that I, I see that the fear that is driving our current situation is also led by what we talked about earlier is that there's, we can't even agree on basic truths yeah. these days and misinformation. So how do you stick with your optimism when we can't agree on those basic tenets mm -hmm. of truth? You know, and I think, I mean, you're absolutely right. It worries me a lot. And I wish I had a, a you know, immediate, obviously a valid solution. But I think that we could do something legislatively as a society to damp this down. And one would be leaning a lot harder on the on the large platforms, right? Because they all have this uh, run by this algorithm that the more controversy that a, a posting awakens, the more you know, it, the more people want to listen to it. So you keep it, and since you earn money by advertising, so th that has to be done. But also, I think we're being much too easy with the media in general. I see. We have this, I think, anomaly. If I say about you as another politician, you're taking money from the mafia, you sue me for a whole lot of money. And I not only have to give you a whole lot of money, but I have to produce an equally big denial. But if I, as a, uh, you know, as a whatever commentator on Fox News, uh, what is the name of that dreadful guy? Yeah, right. If I say that on Fox News, Nobody touches me because the answer is, well, Fox News wouldn't let that on the news program, right? But I'm just giving my opinion. Okay. Well, okay. I'm just giving my opinion when I say you're taking money from mafia, but sorry, that doesn't, doesn't work in that case. Why should it work in the case where you're not just wrecking an individual's reputation, but you're wrecking the operation of the system? And... I think, I mean, a lot of Americans say First Amendment, First Amendment. Well, this is not 
supposedly an opinion, right? This is touching a matter of fact. So, I mean, actually, the some of the people who make the voting machines have used this. You are implicitly saying that our voting machine produced a lie. So there, there are cases in, which may come through when they go through the Supreme Court. Question, do you trust the present American Supreme Court? <laughs> but, but, but I mean, the legislation could do this. So there are various things that we can do to chip away at the you know, plural truth society that we now live in. Yes. Just as a comment, infuse a little positivism in this negative situation. There is a little positive in that they lost, the, what's this guy's name, anybody remember? Multi-million dollar suit because he claimed that Sandy Hook, one of the uh, Alex Jones, yeah. one of the Alex Jones, one of the uh, school shootings didn't happen. Right, right, right. Yes. So he did lose. He went all the way up pretty high. I don't yeah. think he went to the Supreme Court. Yeah. But you know, he's he's got to find a multi million dollars. Of course, now he's fundraising to yeah. pay that. But yeah, yeah. there's a little hope. <laughs> little hope, except that it, only because they interpreted it as a terribly painful thing to inflict. Which it was on the on the parents. So in other words, he had to be sued by somebody who could say, "I suffered from this." Right. Whereas, you know, when you get lies like Tucker Carlson is always spreading, they some of them can't be covered by that. Hi, I'm Lugino Bruni from from the University of Rome, Lumsa. One one short comments and one question. I think the what we said to be ethics is becoming fully human. I think I don't know if is enough because I, in particular Christianity, I think the, the idea of Christianity is that to be fully human is not enough because we have to do something more. Uh, because uh, there are also some uh, complexity in our humanity, some uh, uh, I don't know, passions that are not so good to, to express fully. I don't know, that's just... Yeah. And then uh, the, the question is, uh, if you can say something more about meritocracy, because the meritocracy is becoming actually the new religion of capitalism, eh? it is uh, the new moral legitimation of uh, inequality, mm -hmm. based on the idea that uh, uh, Talent is merit. I think uh, there's a very uh, a huge misunderstanding about the meritocracy. If you can say something more, I would be very Sorry, grateful. You're saying because what's that word? That you have, uh, meritocracy. Meritocracy. Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry yeah, for sorry. English. I, no, that's very much part of the uh, part of the uh, mindset which is making this uh, making this possible. And I really don't. I couldn't say anything that goes beyond that remarkable book by. Michael Sandel called the tyranny of merit, where he really shows, first of all, the role of all this in creating the climate, but also he really deeply uh, debunks. I mean, that people who are had a really high flying education at Harvard and then went on to be managers and so on, that they should think of them as totally self made when parents pay for it. And so it just, you know. You would beggar's imagination that anybody could believe that, but but it needed to be really uh, deconstructed. And Michael has done an absolutely wonderful job in this book. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Doctor. My name is Father Faven. Uh, I'm from Toronto oh. in Canada. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if I'm the only Canadian, but anyway. Um, one of my questions, I, I really don't know much about the theoretical side of, you know, all this, but uh, one of the questions that I've had is more pers personally at a, you know, at my level, at the level of, um, I guess, immigrants in Canada. I was born in Abu Dhabi, and then I came to Canada at the age of 13. And, you know, being a Catholic, you know, you kind of find yourself kind of caught between all these different discussions at different levels. On the one hand, of course, as a Catholic, I, I identify with the Christian sort of the Christian identity of Canada to some extent, uh, to whatever extent it is Christian. But on the other hand, you know, from the racial perspective, you can see, at least I see and I perceive that there's 
perhaps a growing divide and a growing kind of resentment from various sides, you know, it's not just, you know, white people against black people, but it's like, you know, uh, even, you know, maybe Chinese people against uh, like brown people. It's, it's just very complicated. Yeah. So given all of that, I've, I've always been kind of thinking like, how do we resolve this in a way that I acknowledges the fact that many of us belong to different Mm -hmm. cultural groups belong to different kind of identity groups and yet we have because of that these fears of losing something of what seems to be essential to our identity mm -hmm. um so you know when i think about being catholic on the one hand i want to preserve whatever is left of the christian identity of canada of toronto but on the other side, I recognize that, yeah, there are some ways in which, you know, a growing immigrant population could change that dynamic. Mm -hmm. And yet being raised in Abu Dhabi doesn't really cause me to be afraid of that too much because I realize it strength, strengthens my identity. Anyway, I, I'm not sure how to pose the question, but I'm wondering, given the multicultural nature of Canada, how do we kind of take into account these real fears that people have about losing a part of themselves, mm -hmm. but then also trying to find a way to say that it could perhaps be a way to strengthen the identity that we have or strengthen even the culture that we have, mm -hmm. uh, if you have any thoughts. Yeah. Okay, well, if, if you, uh, I mean, the, the Christian identity of Canada as a whole is in fact gone i mean it's not you know if, if this were a vast majority of society of, of people practicing it then it wouldn't be the case that was the case of previous society so the question really is uh do do you find that life in this kind of society can be enriching and do your compatriots also see that in which case your own identity gets another kind of affirmation you know you you add something right? and that's what happens when you get a society where this ethic of in, difference as enrichment is really installed is you you add something to the conversation you add something to the relationships around you and that is can be a kind of affirmation of your being whatever you are that you would you would get in another way if the whole society were catholic but you know that's never going to be the case again we're entering an epoch in which there's going to be immense amount of even increasing diversity but in which the spiritual uh, different spiritual directions, including the Catholic one that we share, uh, have something very important to say and can actually be heard even by people who are not ever thinking of converting. Um, my, my question is very similar um, to the previous, but follows up a little bit. Um, I, I'm really fascinated by this idea that you touched on um, of this general tendency to categorize people into us versus them um, and that that in group versus out group and and how there's a general tendency to distrust those of of the out group right and it kind of goes um, along with that line um, and so we know that there are a lot of potential negative effects of of that um and that they're to solve many of the, our pressing issues of our time that we really need to get beyond that but i think we're do, i'm wondering do you have thoughts about how to do that so for instance um what would what kinds of factors might motivate someone or incentivize um people to actually want to and and be motivated to um 
to inter interact beyond those differences and to come together with people who are very different from you, might have very different goals or values than yourself. Um, and in order to get beyond some of those uh, issues. So just curious about some of your thoughts on that. Well, but it can happen in a more superficial way or a deeper way. More superficial way, which very often happens first, is you're in some kind of enterprise, a political movement or any kind of common enterprise, and you have somebody from a very different religious or cultural background, and you're kind of struck by <laughs> what she or he says or their contribution to the common deliberation. And that's certainly been part of my experience. I mean, being engaged a lot in politics, uh, you know, <clears throat> you're always in these movements. But then it goes beyond that, it can go beyond that, if you find that engaging in a conversation about their view, your view, their deep spiritual sources, your deep spiritual sources, if you find that a rewarding uh, conversation, right? So there are these two kind of stages, one in which you, you know, Okay, to me, it's, it's the political realm. I'm in a political party, <laughs> working in an election, and the, the, the other people are surrounding me from these different backgrounds. And frankly, I've seen, felt cases where uh, what they are saying, what we should do coming from their background, yeah, it's very sensible, very, you know, contribution. That's stage one. So I kind of value their being there. But stage two is when you find yourself interested enough to say, well, what is it to be, uh, you know, whatever it is, and how do you feel about it, and <clears throat> how do you react to all of us, and <clears throat> and uh, and I, I discovered in my life, and I think this is true, that that can be a tremendously rewarding experience. So you've moved to the second stage. I think people don't jump into the second stage. I think they can be... Uh, induced to go into that kind of exchange because working together, rubbing shoulders, dealing with whatever, in whatever way, they're struck by the, the contribution. Um, my question actually partially builds on what uh, Carla asked earlier. Um, so I consider myself a cautious optimist, and I was really comforted to hear about your solution, the hope you see in young people. Uh, my question for you is what role you see of technology in that future, uh, especially when we talk about young people, we cannot ignore that. That's very much part of their life. And by technology, I particularly mean technologies on the internet. Um, and the reason I, I that that sometimes keeps me awake at night is is how important role these technologies today are playing um, in controlling what information we get to see, or or hear, or share with others, or find the social connections that probably are absent today elsewhere offline. Mm -hmm. um, to give you some examples, half of U.S. population gets their news on Facebook, hmm. um, and in the global South, vast majority of the vast majority of the people, the internet is the Facebook and WhatsApp. Um, what I'm curious to hear from you is: these information ecosystems are today controlled primarily by a few different multi-billionaire corporations, and that worries me in terms of what accountability we can envision going forward in terms of what information we do get to hear about, we don't get to hear about, and what that means to bridge the the, the social disconnectedness that yeah, we are seeing yeah, today. Yeah, yeah. No, I think there's a, not a single, but a whole, whole gamut of answers to that. I mean, number one that has to be looked into, the, the internet and these uh, media can do a lot of good. I mean, for instance, Tahrir Square in, in uh, 2000, <clears throat> 2012. Unfortunately, the movement hasn't worked out very well in Egypt, but certainly you had a moment when it was made possible by precisely that kind of communication, getting a lot of people to come there. And the, the people who did come there had the kind of mindset to a large degree. But in this, that case, the difference between, you know, people who are leading Muslim Brotherhood and people who weren't, uh, came together. Right? On the other hand, 
we see now with the further development of the internet and the platforms that it can be used to further conspiracy theories, uh, absolutely crazy whip, whip up. I mean, to the point where you can plant something uh, about somebody being uh, doing some terrible thing and very often the person can be lynched. I mean, that happens in before you know, see. So it's very bewildering. You have to think through uh, all this. And uh, thirdly, uh, to get to a, a theme that was very much raised earlier about uh, <clears throat> people growing up very lonely, uncommunicative, and so on, there is a way of getting absorbed with your games and so on as a kid that can intensify that sense of loneliness, which is actually something that is really very, very dangerous for the for, your, for yourself, let alone <laughs> doesn't allow you to. So all this has to be worked out. And I confess that I haven't really managed to worry that I don't think anybody's quite worked this out. But the answer to your question is terribly complex. <laughs> but these are these are the issues that you have to, uh, if you can see how to get the good, the tarrier square type thing, and not get the bad. The wild accusations, conspiracy theories, the election was fraud, and, so, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I know we have a question here, and then a couple more. Are there? We probably can take these three. If there are any others right now, why don't we take these three, and then we'll wrap it up there. So, and please introduce yourselves. <laughs> Thanks for, for the wonderful lecture. My name is Alessandra Arcuri. I'm professor of international economic law in, uh, at Erasmus University in Rotterdam. I'm a native Roman, so I'm here for a holiday. And that's why I ended up in this lecture. I'm, I'm very fascinated because in, in, in my field, one of the problems that I see vis-a-vis -vis democracy is, in fact, international treaties that protect capital. Uh, they put capital on steroids, particular investment treaties where countries uh, have to crush uh, the pressure, the bottom-up democratic pressure, because they can be sued by big uh, multinational. So uh, my question to you is, you, you seem to uh, point at the importance of legal institutions to uh, ramp up democracy. What about uh, the international level? Can we uh, think of energizing democracy without uh, thinking of the international uh, dimension no, of no, it. Absolutely. So what we, there's another whole area that we have very clear and powerful needs, but it's not going to be necessarily uh, easy. We have to have a deal, not between all countries, but between, let's say, all the really rich economies about taxation. Now, there is a kind of deal in the G7, the minimum 15%, but we've got to go beyond that, right? And I mean, uh, there has to be, first of all, better policing of money being placed in <laughs> Panama and something like that. But there has to be a deal. It doesn't have to cover everybody because it has to really cover the major economies. Because if, if you know, the United States raises the taxes, people can go to Berlin or go to London. But if we get these three and a few other big economies together on this, we don't have to fear people putting their money in Monaco, it's, it's not going to happen, right? So that is actually within possible reach now, but it's going to, uh, the difficulty is going to take a constellation of enlightened governments in a number of <laughs> different states at, at the same time. Right? Um, and secondly, there, uh, there's a whole lot of uh, possible sources of revenue I mean, there is this Tobin tax, right? Which would be, Tobin tax idea was for every transaction on the international financial markets, some tiny percentage of what money changed hands would be paid into this fund, which would be shared by all the countries who agreed to, you know, <clears throat> to uh, support this legislation. And I think this is fiercely resisted by the financial world, although the percentage could be just incredibly infinitesimally small, but because of the tremendous large number of transactions, a large number of dollars or whatever, pounds or whatever, <clears throat> it could amount to something really 
pretty considerable. Now, these are just two ideas, but there are, there are other ideas that people have, and they could be enacted, they could be put into force by seven or eight governments and, and stick and really work, right? But in the absence of that, we have governments, I think this is your point, the governments that are starved of resources to do very important things, including fighting global warming and having an adequate health system and having an adequate system to take care of the elderly, et cetera, et cetera. Um, th thanks very much indeed, Charles, for, for your lecture. I just wonder whether you could say a little more about the possible role of the spiritual uh, and the religious. So what I'm thinking of here is the way that you're celebrating plural difference of kinds of people, but you're worried about plurality of truths. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I just wonder whether we don't need as academics to be a little more sympathetic to the people looking for alternative truths in the sense that in however misguided a way they're protesting against the the blandness of the normative sort of merely empirical or rational instrumentalized truth as being yeah. you know the only thing that binds us together and i think it relates to some things you're saying that they're they're okay they're reacting to the the atavistic but they're 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 looking for thick identities and something more intangible if you like so could it be the case as i think somebody else has suggested that maybe it's only religions that really get us beyond this because um they tend to suggest that what combined us together is a much thicker kind of kind of kind of truth you know that is not contemptuous of the symbolic and the personal uh, that, that you can't fully explicate, yeah. but that also has the sense that because this is a transcendent truth, there's a certain space for, for variety. Yeah, you know, that's, yeah. it, I, I mean, it, it's almost, it, I'm sound, sounding a bit like King Charles III here and, and his perennialism, but I don't think he's completely wrong about this, you know, that this maybe is, is the, way, uh, the way forward, that religions will approach it from their different angles, yeah. but, but, but more of a sense of a, a shared religiosity yeah. may be the only thing that allows us to escape, you know, this, this tension between the emptily abstract and the dangerously concrete. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I would say, my way of putting it would be to say that that kind of uh, mindset, which says we've got to shy away from uh, sick with science or clearly established public facts and so on, that would, uh, you can't live, no, no human being could live by that alone, because and this is precisely involved in the same point about the, the ethical, our sense of what a really fulfilled life is, our sense of what a really noble life is, and so on. Whatever we're steering by, we don't have the vocabulary in natural science for that. We don't have the vocabulary in mathematics for that. We work out our vocabularies, and as many of them have been worked out, and they are all invariably have some degree of, of uh, the, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, the uh, uh, metaphor, the, the, the metaphoric to them. Words, they, they have a, we have a sense of something higher, something more powerful, right? They have, I mean, something with my own kind of uh, life, uh, the, the sense that uh, love, agape, is a kind of power that is coming down, and in my case, from the, from God, which I can connect to and be a, a higher, better person, right? And, but I'm saying higher, better, fuller. Well, what does that mean exactly? You know, you can't measure that. You can't say it's so many inches and this is so many inches more. You can't say that the glass is half and it's not full in that sense. And 
it's an absolutely absurd idea to think that you could live a complete human life eschewing all that kind of vocabulary. It just isn't, just isn't possible. Uh, Tyler Vanderweel, Harvard University, uh, thank you so much for your, your lecture. Um, I did want to uh, return to the question Julianne posed on, on sort of hope. You, you, had, you had pointed towards the torch that had been passed from, from Gandhi to Martin Luther King Jr. to others, to us all, um, and, and of sort of the, the, the ethics of, of a human life well, well lived. And I, I was hoping you could perhaps unpack more what, what you envisioned there. I mean, is it a greater emphasis on, on human dignity that needs to be throughout the society? Is it a movement towards uh, encouraging, promoting love of neighbor? Is it, is it creating a discourse around human flourishing or all, all of the above but what you know what, what is the content of that torch that is being passed on that that is our hope yeah well I mean it's very hard to give a kind of definitive content I uh, you know, there are obviously a few things that are very important to me like uh, I mean as I know, my inspiration is uh, the New Testament right you have this extraordinary figure who not only had this immensely powerful canotic love, but also had the power to see people in all their difference, right? Now, we mostly don't do that. I mean, we mostly can't do that. We mostly see people in kind of masses or this guy fits into the slot or there's that same kind of boring questioner I had last week, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Involuntarily, <laughs> we use these categories but in actual fact, people we really get to know, we know that they're much richer and more specific than that, right? And this power, you know, Jesus had this extraordinary power to have to see that person, right? So these are these are things that are these are powers that are there in the spiritual tradition, in this case, Christian, but others as well, which we grievously lack in general, we're way by. And they could be much more widespread and they could be much more, you know, more deeply implanted in me. And so a great deal of spirituality involves this sense of I'm called to be something much better than I am. And I feel that here is a source and here is a practice, meditation or the sacraments. Or, you know, right? And of course, this gets so close to what people call the great mystics and so on. You can see, you can read them in that, of seeing that kind of thing. You know? But it's so hard to communicate, you know, that it's, you know, Meister Eckhart, I, I sort of get it, I sort of get it, but I'm sure I don't totally get it, right? <clears throat> well, please join me with thanking Professor Taylor for this.